So in order to get a key onto a wall like cob, which has got a slightly friable surface, we're going to harl a first coat of lime mortar. This will stick well to the, to the cob, to the earth here. It will also stick well to stone or brick and provide a nice key for the next plastered coat that we're going to apply. It will also help to control suction. If you've got a very thirsty material like cob or brick, they'll tend to draw all the moisture out of your coats of render or plaster very quickly and you'll get a, not such a good lime mortar out of that, lime plaster or lime render. So we're going to control suction by harling the first coat onto the wall with a lime mortar. We're going to be using a 3.5 to 1 or a 3 to 1 lime mortar mix with a little bit of that Potsland that I mentioned earlier. We're going to be using Metastar as the Potsland that we add. That's the one that's been made in Cornwall. The mixture is quite simple. It's that lime mortar that we saw, saw earlier. Quite stiff to start with. We're going to whisk in some clean water. And once we've whisked the two together, we're going to end up with this mix, like a slurry, which we're going to use to harl against the wall. That's the kind of consistency you're looking for. Thin enough to spread evenly along the whole edge of the harling trowel and not so thick that it will just go into the wall in clumps. You can see how well that's stuck to the harling trowel. A thin covering over the whole blade. And Rick will be using that to provide that key to that cob wall. OK, we're just going to brush off the loose material. It's especially important on a cob wall. You don't want lots of bits of cob falling off the wall when you apply your harling coat. We're damping up the wall with the churn brush here, but you can use a garden sprayer or a plant sprayer. You want to spray it up a good hour before you do the harling. Give plenty of time for the cob to absorb the water and then it's going to reduce shrinkage. Don't just do it one minute before you come to harl. So we're giving this a good soak about an hour before we come to harl it. The hard coat is just a thin coat. You're not trying to build up any thickness. This is to give you a key for the next thicker coat and to control shrinkage. It's harder backhand, but when you go round a house, you're going to have to do backhand and forehand. So if you're practicing, first of all, practice on the forehand and then switch round to the backhand. Don't forget the plastic on the floor. Don't forget to cover the neighbour's BMW, the cat, the drainage, the downpipes, anything that could be a source of litigation between you and the neighbour, because this is a messy operation. That's why it's especially important to wear your safety glasses and some gloves. As you can see, it's quite a quick operation if Rick's doing it. Now we've left the hard coat to dry and uh, if necessary we've wetted it down if it's a um, uh, particularly warm time of year to control the curing process and uh, after two or three days it's probably ready to put the scratch coat on. I'm going to do a couple of slow motion shots here. do is just put a band along the top
So we're using a lime mortar here with hair in. What you don't want to do is start down too low. You start down there and you run out. So it's going right up through. And if this was for outside, we'd have added some of the pot salon in as well, the Metastar, to give it a little bit of early strength. I'm just going to need another dub coat just to get it out to a reasonable shape. Once you've got it on, we're going to just scratch it through, and then we'll be probably looking to recoat it in three to four days, depending on how quick it's going to dry and what suction's behind it. And you don't want to do the scratching immediately after you've plastered. You want to leave it for sort of ten minutes or so, just to let it tack off a little tiny bit. You don't want to go too deep, end up cutting it like a cheese wire. Just to remind you that it needs wetting between coats. So we dubbed out the wall to get all the unevenness out. This is an outside wall, and we're going to finish with an unhaired lime mortar, which we're going to apply in the same way as the haired coat, and then we're going to finish it off with a wood float. outside work you want to leave a good three or four days between coats you don't want it to dry out too quickly so it's important to protect it in hot or dry times of the year possibly by putting up some wet hessian or some old curtains and dampening them down it's important that the lime has a little bit of moisture so that it can carbonate as a crystalline form rather than just as a chalky form so drying out too quickly isn't a good thing you need to control that suction that's why we were wetting down the walls beforehand and also perhaps even lightly spraying them on a hot day. If you remember, for all the outside coats, we've added a bit of that Potslan in, the Metastar, to help it to set off a little bit earlier. The mortar's gonna set, first of all, by losing moisture as it evaporates, that'll give it some strength. And then the Potslanic reaction will kick in after about 10 days to a fortnight. And that will last for about another two or three weeks and then the carbonation will carry on even behind that. It might take several months before all the lime in this coat is fully carbonated. So if your wall is exposed to frost or extremes of weather, that's why we've added the pot slan in. You don't need hair in the final coat because you're going to be floating this up with a wooden float. That's going to help to press in any tendency of the lime to shrink a little. And it's a slightly thinner coat than the haired coats behind it. The backing coats were a little bit thicker with the hair in because you had to make up all the holes and defects in the wall. But this final coat is probably about 10 mil to 12 mil, just under half an inch thick. We're plastering right down to the ground here, but it's equally as traditional to finish a little bit above the stone plinth and leave the stone plinth exposed. That varied all over the villages as to what kind of finish people wanted. If the stone plinth was made of reasonably good stone and worth showing, then it's okay to have that exposed and have extra breathability at that point in the wall.
as this is the final coat outside, we're not finishing with an upward drag of the trowel, but leaving the texture fairly smooth, ready to be wood floated in. So this is that outside final finish. It's been left for a little while to dry up a little bit and firm up a bit, and it's now ready to take a wood float. This is gonna compress the lime mortar in, remove any shrinkage as it occurs, and leave a nice open textured finish, which will be ready to accept a lime wash as the final finish outside. If you look at the action, it's a circular action with most of the weight on the heel of the wood float and the top end of the wood float actually reasonably free of the mortar. If you press over the whole length of the float, it will stick to the wall and you won't be able to move it. Water drains down the wall, so the render at the top of the wall is always ready to float a little bit earlier than the render at the bottom of the float of the wall. So an open floated texture from a wood float is one fine way of finishing an outside wall. But also it's um, traditional that you can actually sponge on top of that as well. We're going to use an old sponge here just to take out any tool marks, any float marks and follow the curves. If you've got a very curvy wall, it's, it's sometimes difficult to, to wood float it absolutely without blemish. And a sponge will help you to, to move a little bit of the mortar around and just level the wall off into a a nice flowing surface. You don't want the sponge or the wall too wet, otherwise you'll form a bit of a slab.